So, um, okay, so this is welcome to the finance meeting. Today's meeting is our agenda review. And so uh, we might as well jump in with that. Before we start, we must honor the day. We got to pass on the tax bill being paid, right? <laughs> Wait a minute, we have an extension. We have an extension. What a year, what a year. <laughs> I'm just sorry to shut my door. Uh, so, um, so Doug, you want to take us through the agenda? Sure, but not all 900 pages, okay? I'll okay. just no. pick the resolutions. Oh, just that. <laughs> the highlights. Hey, hey, Doug, I'm issuing a moratorium sometime around pages on the on the. Yeah. <laughs> yes. All the trees are cringing, you know. Yeah. Let's spend that budget for paper. All right, so we'll uh, just jump in here and kind of get started. Actually, I guess it would help if I share my screen so you guys can see it. Right? So let me do that. And uh, okay, let's see. All right, you should be able to see the agenda, right? Everybody can see the agenda. Yep. Okay. yep. All right. Okay. Uh, now scroll down here, just jump in through. Obviously, uh, six public hearings, uh, just heads up on that. Quite a few public hearings on this on this meeting. Yeah, that's quite a few. Jumping down to resolutions. The first one is a continued resolution because it was laid over uh, last month's meeting. So, um, Doug, can you let Kathy in? I don't know that it's anything pertaining to uh, finance, but... Um, you know, that, that's, I'll just kind of skip over that there. So uh, jumping into the next section here, the monthly financial reports. I don't think that there was anything out of the ordinary um, associated with that. I think everybody has the ability, I just double check in this Kathy's logging into mute and unmute yourselves here. I think I set that on this, so. Um, the, the journal entries. Journal entries. Kate, you want to touch on this one here? Yeah, yeah. Or, or Linda, if you want to introduce it and we can go into it more. Yeah, so we, we had a discussion here at the meeting, I think last month, there were some um, old outstanding things that needed to be cleared up. And one of my concerns is I really would like all of this stuff to be cleared up before I leave the board. And so that means we'd like to make these entries, whatever they were going to be in 2020s books, not have them held over for a board that isn't um, fully up to speed with them. So I was uh, working with Kate and Joe Del Forti offline on what are all the different things that happened as we brought in the new system, as we transitioned people, as we did all these things, what, what still needed to be cleaned up. And um, we are initially had some numbers that we were talking about that whatever they were going to be, we were going to clean them up. Um, and we're happy to tell you that as we went through and looked at cleaning up all of the things, they netted down to a very tiny number. Um, and Kate's going to now roll through some detail of uh, what these things were so that people can be familiar so that we can vote this in and then what will happen then is our books will be as clean as they could be going into 2021 so that anyone who's still on the board um, can rest assured that you know we did our best to give them the cleanest books they could have. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Linda. So the first four journal entries that you see here are the four adjustments that we had discussed just very briefly at the last finance meeting. These are some items that have been continuously carried over and in, uh, you know, from year to year when you can see that things aren't changing, typically that means um, we need to look into it a little bit more. So we did exactly that and we're looking to make some adjustments to those numbers that um, just, just simply aren't as accurate. Maybe something happened in the past, it got forgotten or um, it got dropped off. So um, in, these, in these first four, these are um, entries. The entry um, two and entry four directly um, hit cash. As you can see, we've identified the account that those are going to adjust. 
and then journal entry one and journal entry three, those are more um, what we consider a fund balance, or I'm sorry, a balance sheet adjustment, where we'll see that change at the end of the year when we total up all our revenues and all our expenses. These will decrease our fund balance because we had previously had it a little bit overstated for these items that were receivable. And then when you look at journal entry five and six, these we've added in in the conversation that we've been talking about. And what these do is when ENCODE was first implemented, there were some entries that um, were put in to kind of correct things. Maybe an old number was imported or some, in, some information got missed. There also were a few adjustments from the audit that needed to be entered. But because the activity was in the prior year, there was never um, an entry in the bank reconciliation that would allow us to zero that out because it had already been done. So these entries were just hanging out. And what we did is we looked at kind of the net um, adjustment to clear these out. And you can see the very top line of journal entry number five says uh, $249.89. That was the total net amount to make all of these adjustments, which you can see are 53, 20, $75,000. But ultimately what they do is they net to 249, so $250. And by making these two adjustments, we'll clear all of that information off of the bank reconciliations. And then each month you'll see only real accurate, current and true information as we move forward. So this is the last of the transition to our new system. Um, and it was complicated by the fact that obviously we lost the old system in the hacking incident. So um, we were very relieved to see how they netted together. It gave us the feeling like um, we were on the right path because it wasn't creating a big question in our mind, like what really happened here. So, and I felt really comforted by Joe being involved. I mean, he's been doing this kind of accounting for a long time and is was still very active in it up till last year, I think when he retired. So it was a good, um, it was really great to have him working with us. Yeah, extremely helpful to have him. Anyway, does anyone have any questions on this? This was the, uh, I really think it's important to book it in 2020. We'll get all that cleared away and then we won't ever be talking about that again, hopefully. Or you won't ever be talking about that. I know I won't. Anything? Okay, thanks. So you that. said, you, uh, Linda, you just, uh, Kate, I know you just said 2020. I believe the plan is to book these as of December 31st, 2020, right? So that right. going right. forward, 21 is clear. Yes. And then that, that also we'll be disclosing this to the auditors that we did this in case they have any uh, problems with it, they can then opine on it. Um, I think, we think they won't, but um, you never know. And it was really timely. The auditors, I think, are due what this week, next week. Yeah, Monday they'll start. So perfect timing. Thanks, Kate. Okay. So the next resolution, just moving forward here, this is a budget transfer relating to the evaluation of land purchases. We had some expenses relative to um, the process that we went through over the last couple of months. So this moves some money over from contingency into the, uh, the line called purchase of land capital uh, so that we can uh, book some of those expenses against that. We had expenses for legal counsel. We had expenses for bond counsel. They were uh, waiting, sitting on hold, waiting to uh, move everything forward. And they were following the process as well as our um, bonding folks. So, uh, you know, we did generate some expenses relative to all of that. And so these expenses will flow through. They're not going to be, um, I mean, this is a question. I'm saying it as a statement, but we're, we're expecting these to flow through as expenses in 2021. Is that what we're saying? Correct. We're not holding it to cap or, or Correct. Capital. Okay. Correct. Yep. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Any questions on any of that? Uh, the next resolution here is a budget transfer for the Kramer Road Water District. Uh, Jim, do you want to just kind of touch on, or Kate, I know you both work together on this one. So. 
Yeah, so when uh, we created the budget for this extension, at the time, uh, unbeknownst to all of us, the cost of pipe, metal, concrete has all gone up, and the additional expenses weren't included in the original budget. So I'm asking to transfer from engineering to the Kramer Road extension, 16000 to cover the cost. Sounds good. I've heard of the pipes going up. That's crazy, the cost increases. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on that one? Uh, the next resolution, the approval of the credit card payment contract uh, for Park and Rec. Uh, this rel really relates to the um, the fees that were charged. And uh, Jean has been working on this. Jean, did you want to touch on this one? Um, sure, absolutely. So with the new reservation program, Astra, um, we've had to update and the fee schedule is another uh, resolution. But these are the fees that um, will be charged to the people that are booking online or even through our office, it's a 15 cent cart fee, um, which is what we were charging before. Um, and the credit card processing fee, the 2.75% is a little bit more than um, what we were processing before. Same company, but their rates had increased. Um, so, but this company using the same company because um, there were the very select few companies that could be used um, to go with Astra. So I'd rather had used a company that we were previously using um, and other rates, the processing fee rates were, were the same. So I wanted to go with Municipal again. So they've been great to work with, um, always been able to answer questions. So didn't I see, I don't, I feel like last night I was reading this and I saw something about a $5 fee. Yep, that's part of the car, that's, that's gonna be on the fee schedule itself. What is yes. that? That is um, when people go online to the book your site fee. Um, book your site. Um, the Astra charges a five dollar book your cart fee. So, um, so if people that's only if people are on um, go through the website and goes through their site directly. Um, if they call us and book through us, then that book your site fee does not exist. So. Are we encouraging people to use that site that charges $5 or no? Uh, yes. <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be totally up to them. I mean, we, we are going to launch it um, hopefully tomorrow um, and get it out there and see what happens and see if we get any feedback from that. And um, I mean, it's something that we, we can't, the only way it can be avoided is if people call the office and um, book the reservation through us. So that's not the reservation system that's actually charging that. That's the actual credit card processing company, right? That's charging that? The $5? No, that is the Astra. That is Astra. That's, that's the book your site. Yep. <laughs> and so then keep in mind also Astra is the new reservation system and that's the one that teams up with uh, like Airbnb and VRBO and those types of things. So Reserve people, America and all those. And all yep. that. So people would be booking, you know, they could even book through like Airbnb to rent one of our cabins and everything. I think our cabins are going to get a lot more use from people that wouldn't otherwise know that they're available because of that system. Okay. So it's the system. Correct. Yeah, it's not us, it's the system. I just noticed that, I know this is a draft, but it says engraved blade. I don't think we want that there. That's- It says what? what? It says bench sponsorship and engraved blade. Blade, oh yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, we got we'll change it. In number, you know what, on another spelling error that I noticed in number 78, the word evaluation is spelled wrong. So it's it, not, number 78 was, one that the resolution? Really, yeah, the title oh. evaluation is spelled wrong. Okay. So, but I had a note to myself. In fact, I realized. And you can just fix that, right? With the minute. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, so while you're talking about the fee schedule, that's the next resolution here. Right? Oops. Yes, go. I can definitely talk about that. Um, the fee schedule, uh, we've got some 
changes to it. I just wanted to put on there at the beginning of the fee schedule um, when the cabins are available for rental. Um, so that way it's um, known um, from year to year. Um, and when certain, like the Gorham Lodge and Crouch Hall and Outhouse Park, when they're all, they're gonna be available year round. So we wanted to put that at the beginning of the fee schedule so it was clear. And then again, um, as you scroll down, there is the credit card fee schedules, the new ones. Um, also with the um, adoption, possible adoption of the changes to chapter 152, which is the parks, there is um, the ability for organizations to obtain a facility alcohol permit. So that's one of the changes there. Um, we're saying that to be $100. Uh, we're going to be deleting the summer recreation program. Um, we can always add that back in if we decide to um, do that ourselves again, but with a contract with the city, we decided to take it out. And the only other thing um, I think is underwater. Um, and this was something um, that Jim had asked to be changed and the price per gallon for Hopewell, Farmington and Gorham. Um, Jim, that's actually dropped. Um, I don't remember what the other dollar figure was. I believe it was over $2 down to $1.93. So I so think- Each year the city submits to me and Doug uh, the formula they use to determine their wholesale rate. And it changes each year, somewhere between, you know, eight to 12 cents per thousand. So if they sell less, it costs more. If they sell more, it costs less for us. So that's why it changes each year. So this $1.93 is what the city tells us it is? The city tells us that's what we're going to pay them for a thousand gallons of water. So we pay them for it and then we charge these guys because we it passes through us correct and we don't we don't recover anything extra for the pass through no because all these look other than no we don't because gorham is only as an ad needed basis their valve is typically off a lesser water crew plant is um not worked in farmington it's a bi-directional valve they only buy water from us when it's needed. And then Hopewell, the only reason why they buy from us is because they have to go through a municipal line from the city. And what about, why is Bloom, East Bloomfield still $2.62? Because they, they purchase water directly from us that we have to pump to our tank, through our transmission lines, to a meter pit. Then okay. East Bloomfield has additional costs. Okay, so they're the ones who we are incurring expenses and we're charging. Yes. And then when the city told us the rate, did it impact the East Bloomfield rate or not? No, because it actually went down a few cents from last year. With them. The rate went down a few cents. Yes. Because this, this other one changed pretty significantly, right? I don't recall the last year's rate. It was like $2.10. Yeah, something around that. Yeah, like that. So, so I I just was thinking that the somehow East Bloomfield would also probably go down, but well, and I don't think no, we changed Bristol's either, right? Bristol. No, we haven't changed Bristol's, Bristol's either yet. So, but no, Linda, we just got this new project going with all these pumps and everything. So, we got to start recouping our costs. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, no, so I agree that we need to uh, make sure that we're. Uh, balancing it all out. If we have more expenses, we have to pass them all off. So the other thing that's going on is there's a water agreement between the city of Canandaigua and all these different municipalities and how that thing is all derived. And this goes back 30 years and is in desperate need of a rewrite. Um, but um, in that agreement, it spells out how much the municipalities are going to pay and how it's all going to be calculated and everything else. The agreement was supposed to be, work was supposed to begin on updating that agreement last year, but obviously with COVID that got delayed. I just had a conversation with the city manager uh, about hopefully getting that started later this year into next year, but that's definitely going to be something that's going to be uh, 22 by the time that works through its process. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Kate, uh, Kate's been working for us, so yeah, Resolution A2. Um, we need desperately have to get uh, some sort of reliable internet service in our parks, in particular with um, 
Onanda Park. And Kate has done a lot of research. And Kate, can you specifically touch on, I know you and I talked about, you know, there might not necessarily be a need for putting uh, internet service at that house right at the moment, but they were going to charge us substantially more down the road if we just don't do it right now. And so can you just, when you're touching on this, include that? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it, Doug. So I reached out to Spectrum about providing internet at both Outhouse and Onanda and just looking at what the options would be. So um, for Onanda Park, there is no construction cost to add the internet there. Um, there's the 99 dollar installation fee but no additional cost to the town from spectrum for construction of the lines to physically get there so with outhouse park there were some construction costs um, they need to bring that line across the road and then down outhouse um, outhouse road as well so by adding two locations did, did you tell me that was going to be like nine thousand dollars it was right around 9,000, yeah. So by adding the two locations, what Spectrum was able to do for us was to divide that construction cost between the two new services. And that allowed the cost to go below the threshold of which they would pass it to the customer. So if we were to only do Onanda, it would be the $99 installation fee and the service. But later on down the road, if we wanted to only add Outhouse on its own, we would have to pay that construction fee because it's over their threshold of what would pass. So by having the two together, we're actually saving the construction cost of Outhouse Park. Um, and what we've done there, you can see it's a, a little bit lower monthly cost. It's a standard internet. It's not quite the same speed that we're looking for at Onanda Park where we'll be running multiple pieces of equipment, um, the phones, the internet, also the um, time clock. So um, in addition to that, I did speak with them about the potential for Outhouse West being added. And although they can't say with any um, definite certainty at this time, they did say that it was helpful to have the construction already done to Outhouse Hall. It would likely be no cost to us to simply bring it across the street to Outhouse West. So we're um, definitely planning for the future by making this decision now to move forward. Thank you. Uh, Greg, I have a question. Is is the um, the spectrum relationship with the town of Canandaigua, does that give us any benefit as we're a nonprofit, blah, blah, blah? So we work specifically with Spectrum Enterprise, which is um, a government related entity of spectrum i don't work with the same specific people who would be spectrum business or spectrum residential but there i don't know of any specific benefit to being a municipality that we've received okay. i have a question regarding this is the so this is wi-fi and is it just going to be available to town staff or is this going to be available to everybody so this is not this wi -Fi. is not this is not Wi-Fi. This is actually the cable being run to the building so that we have internet available at our buildings. So this is like almost is it it's coming yeah. in, but we decide whether or not we put Wi-Fi, we do whatever. Correct. So at our house currently there is Wi-Fi that's available for the general public. Um we also need a time clock at Outhouse um, right now, or, or we have in the past. And then uh, there's going to be definitely a need for internet service at Outhouse uh, associated with Outhouse West and the inclusive playground and the building that's being constructed and all that. So this gets that service there. And then it's up to the town to decide if they want to provide public Wi-Fi or not to be determined down the road. At Onanda, we need internet uh, desperately. We have employees that report directly to Ananda. Uh, we need reliable time clocks, which is a problem there because of very spotty cell phone service at Ananda. Mm -hmm. It's very, very difficult to operate that. Also with the new system, uh, residents and guests will be able to pay their parking pass with credit card, which would all need the internet to be able to do that at the gatehouse. So the old days of, hey, I don't have $5 and having to turn around and leave and me getting phone calls with frustration, those are 
those are hopefully gone also with uh, being able to pay by a credit card or uh, obviously they always have the option of parking in the uplands. Also, residents would then be also able to, or guests would be able to book cabins right at Orlando. And this would give us internet service at both the gatehouse and the park ranger station uh, over by the new game room, <clears throat> excuse me, so that uh, we can help with all that stuff. This also al allows us, um, and we're talking a little bit about this this week, the whole parking passes, this allows us to do that electronically because it records the license plates of the vehicles and for us to be able to check. So again, um, an increased need for um, internet there at Onanda. And again, same thing, the town would then need to decide and look at, you know, do we want to provide Wi-Fi service to the general public, which, you know, there certainly is a need at Onanda, but that's that's separately to be determined. We got to get the internet there first, so. Okay, I just asked a question. Um, these are the same rates that I was just given from my new office. And I specific, if I didn't ask, they wouldn't have told me. I specifically asked them if it's an introductory rate and they said yes. So I don't know if you asked that, but after a year, they can raise the rate. Um, they also told me that um, it depends on how much usage we have. So I don't know, you know, being a one person business, that was my rate, but if we were to do all those other things, I don't know if you asked, but it might cost more, just, just to be aware, so. Yeah, that's how the spectrum works, for sure. And that's yeah. the rate for one person, so. Um, he was very clear that it's a month to month agreement. So we did dis we did discuss that it's month to month and that we could decide to change or they could make a change um, from month to month with 30 days notice. I would and expect then, uh, that Kate, I'm sorry, Kathy, go ahead. So I would expect that would be the case. That's what I had heard from a lot of people is after a year they raise it. Kate, I know you also explored other alternatives for us, uh, which didn't sound like were really feasible for specifically Onanda Park. Yeah, exactly. So I did speak with Jen at First Light about providing internet to both of the parks and First Light themselves are unable to provide internet to either location. They offered us um, Frontier service at Onanda Park only, um, which we could potentially just go straight through Frontier, but again, now we're looking at a DSL connection versus a spectrum cable connection. And when it comes to things like the time clock and the credit card system, we want the reliable service. And we've been trying to use the Verizon hotspots at uh, Onanda and it's, um, it's iffy. It's, it's just the cell phone coverage there. As everybody knows, you drive through Cheshire and the phone drops. And then, um, you know, there's spotty service there at, uh, at Onanda with that. So. so will we be getting rid of some of the hotspots? Yeah, I think that's the plan is gotcha. that one in particular. Right? Okay, good. So yes, I think it does Everyone. direct the town manager to cancel the internet service with Verizon. Okay, so yeah, so we'll get rid of the hotspot, at least one. Right. Any more on that one? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, next one, reimbursement for water charges. I see it looks like Jim had to step away, but uh, Kate, I know you worked with him on this one. I think this one is relative to um, somebody that had moved, right? We had talked about. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Wasn't this one on last month's? Um, wasn't I, this I, I asked the same thing, but I was told it was a different customer. It's a oh. different customer. Boy, people are not getting their... Uh, cancellations in when they move, I guess. Well, they, I would assume they just assume because every three months, when no, they don't really- oh, they forget, yeah. They forget and then they don't tell either Kate or um, Jean to, because they have, they have to reply to us and tell us with a form to remove them. Right, well this-, and this we don't, we don't, and we don't always know when they move because some attorneys are very good about letting us know and some attorneys are not in this area and just don't call us. That's what I was going to say. Most attorneys would make sure that you notify all of the utilities and they'll even have a checklist for you. But the local ones know, but the ones that are not local do not. And I do recall speaking with Caitlin on this, there was a new um, assistant at the attorney's office. It was her first week 
when this transfer was made. So I, I do think this was just an oddity uh, that happened due to human error. Well, I, I'm gonna say, I wonder if we shouldn't have some sort of rule of thumb that it needs to be over a certain dollar amount. Pro I mean, the amount of time we're gonna to spend to refund this lady's $26 and the amount of energy that everyone's spending on it. Uh, if, if it was, I just feel like, I know it's a dissatisfier, but it just kind of seems like we're spending way more than $26 to give her back 26. But anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> I'm only one person. Okay. Anything else on that one? No. All right, next one, uh, Lindsay is with us and uh, we put Lindsay to work pretty much her first week saying, hey, it's time to work on health insurance. Woo hoo, you know, one of our favorite, uh, one of our favorite topics. So uh, Lindsay has been working with our broker, Matson Kellogg, um, to evaluate the, uh, the plans and, and what's going on. And we did stick to the same exact contribution strategy is what I would say that we've had the last number of years where, the town pays or the employee pays 5% of the new premium plus 10% of the increase over the previous year uh, added on uh, this at 10% for the silver. And then at the gold that the town would only contribute at the same levels as the silver too, just like what we did last year. And the employee is responsible for the, for the balance. The good news is, and I, I do have the breakdown. It is attached here. And, and Lindsay, you can talk, touch base on this, but the good news is it's under budget. The whole thing is, uh, is under what we had budgeted for. So good news there. Um, there was an increase. Uh, Lindsay, you want to touch on that? And while I'm pulling this up here, give me just a quick second to pull up the, uh, the little chart here. Yes. So there was an overall increase for the bronze and silver plans um, as far as price and an increase in the deductibles um, as seen in the chart over here. Um, for employee costs, it went up. Um, I wouldn't say too much. Um, if you go over just a little bit more to the right, I think it shows the price difference. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, employee monthly cost right there. So the 2305 um, as seen in the chart. Um, so what we put in there too, to just offset the cost and increase in the deductibles, um, we would like to increase the HSA amounts that the town is contributing. Again, like Doug said, it is part of our budget. It's within, um, you know, what we budgeted for our health insurance for this year. Um, and it helps our employees and the town overall based on our strategy. I want to show you, um, this is the side-by-side -side comparison of the, for instance, the, the bronze, just using an exa example here. You can see the uh, rates that have gone up, but you also see the deductible has, oops, where to go, where to go, where is it, Lindsay? Help me out, the deductible went up. Yeah, from uh, 6750 to 7000 for in-network from 13,500 to 14,000 for in-network, out of network went from 7,500 to 10,000 and out of network 15 to 20. So substantial increases in the deductibles. Um, and that was that way for all of the plans with the exception of the gold, right? The gold was the exception where the rate actually went down in the gold. Correct, yep. The gold plan actually had decreased for, um, for us in cost for our employees and for the town. So, the, the rate that the town would pay would be again, the same as the silver. And then the employee would be responsible for everything above, but the employee actually would pay less next year for the gold plan than what they had to pay last year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with the, as, and as Lindsay pointed out, let me find it back here. Um, we're proposing a $300 approximately increase in the uh, HSA contribution just to help with that uh, deductible situation for the employees. Um, the other thing that I've heard from several employees over the last, I would say six months or so, and I know I've even experienced it myself, some of the, some of the medicines and some of the things that were previously covered under uh, our plans uh, are no longer covered. And so it's a little bit more that's having to be paid out of the HSA. Um, but I think that's, you know, I know when I met with our insurance agent, Chris Hubler, relative to the town's insurance, 
we had a conversation about insurance in general and COVID certainly having an impact on insurance and a lot to be determined going forward. So this is probably, you remember four or five years ago, we really had to dig into insurance and really do a massive evaluation. That's probably something I think we'd get by this year, but it's probably something we need to be thinking about going forward again in the next cycle. So. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions on, and, and the good news is it is under budget, so. It is good. And, and re, uh, vision, Lindsay, I think vision was almost the same. I know it's in the attachments, but there was a small change, right? Insignificantly um, small change, so it's, it's around the same. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, the next one here is our, uh, Gene, and I, I apologize that you and I didn't even get a chance to touch on this, but I'm assuming you just need another hundred hours with integrated. <laughs> so. That is correct. Yeah. So we're down to the current contract almost being depleted, um, less than I think 10 hours now. So we do need another hundred hours um, from integrated to keep moving forward. And again, that's still at that reduced rate of $75 an hour, just so the, uh, so everyone's aware, the finance committee is aware and everybody. I did have a, a follow-up conversation last week with the city manager. The city of Geneva and the city of Canandaigua still share uh, IT services. They have two full-time employees that they're sharing IT services. And I was touching base with him. I said, you know, is there an opportunity for the town to be involved with that if we were to go down that road? Um, and we talked about it, generally speaking, but what uh, both the city managers felt was that they would have to increase another employee to be able to take that on, and it would probably be significantly more than the $75 an hour. So I don't think that it's financially advantageous for us to go down that road at this time. We're better off doing it kind of the way we're doing it. Now, this seems like a very cost-effective way when you look at $75 an hour for that. Um, okay, uh, the next one here, appointment of town planner. So we, uh, you know, when we, uh, when we hired uh, Lindsay and our HR payroll coordinator, and we also had formed another uh, team that got together and did the uh, reviews of the uh, applications that we had for the planner position. And Terry, uh, feel free to jump in here. Terry had joined me on that. Um, we had, at first, we had about 15, I think it was, applications for the town planner position. Unfortunately, the county, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, the county said only three of those 15 approximately were qualified. Uh, so they basically weeded out uh, most of them for us and we interviewed the top three. And uh, we talked to the top three candidates. Uh, we had, a, I think, a, a series of good conversations with them. Um, to make a long story short and, and a lot of back and forth, um, one of the top candidates uh, withdrew, decided not to uh, pursue it anymore. Another one, um, just uh, also, uh, generally speaking, is not something they wanted to pursue. And then one, uh, being Shauna Bonchek, uh, who is a town of Canandaigua resident, uh, confirmed her continued interest in the position and, and wishing to be involved. So, um, Terry, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add with, with any of that. Well, I think Shauna had all the qualifications uh, and experiences that uh, we would need in this position for the town. Uh, there were two top candidates of the three, and uh, they were very close in terms of capability and what we uh, you know, heard from them during the interview process. So um, I think uh, this is a good move for the town to bring her in and let her experience what we're doing and make sure it's a good fit going forward. The, the thing that I uh, also um, do really appreciate about Shauna is uh, having previously served as the Yates County planner and, and lived in the town of Canandaigua for quite a few years. She's paid a lot of attention to our planning documents, so she's familiar with those. She also uh, lives uh, just outside the hamlet of Cheshire. Uh, she is an uh, interest in the Cheshire master plan and, and what's happening in Cheshire. She's attended our meetings that we held in Cheshire relative to the sewer. Uh, situation there. She has a full understanding of that. Um, and she's super excited that in the past, in her past work, she has done a lot of the planning documents. And she looks at this as a new opportunity where we have a lot of the planning documents done. 
and now it's time for implementation. And so she's uh, excited. We've had a lot of conversation about that. And obviously I can work with her on, on that. And I have a lot of experience with that myself. Um, Shauna is, um, wants to give her current employer about a month's notice. Uh, so she'd like to transition in. So that's why the resolution says $25 an hour for the time being. And then she would start officially uh, on or around June 1st full time with us uh, as the planner. Additionally, I just want to mention the development office is uh, and kudos to, uh, to Michelle uh, Rillison and Chris Jensen both. Uh, this past month, for the month of um, April, uh, there were, I believe, eight new applications, but last month there were 18 new applications. The month before that, there were 16, and the month before that, there were 12. And so the two of them have really been trying to hold down the fort as much as possible and uh, just being buried. But um, uh, Chris is doing all those determinations and everything right now. Uh, we're we're going to probably need to continue to make some tweaking in the development office for them to be able to keep up to date with everything. But uh, this is a good start to get us going in the right direction. So. All right, I felt like I talked a lot about that one. Any questions on that one? <laughs> nope, welcome. I'm glad we have someone. All right. Um, next one is uh, our standard getting uh, some of our uh, Parks and Rec staff up to date. And, and really seriously, Lindsay, thank you. We threw Lindsay right into the fire. I said, Lindsay, we desperately need park staff. Get on it. So uh, she did. She's been calling. She's even been trying to, I know I heard you on the phone yesterday. You were calling people that have applied to the city of Geneva for stuff and trying. I to... was. I was. I'm not trying to burn bridges between municipalities, but if they have not called them yet, I am calling them. <laughs> That's great. And and Lindsay is also, uh, while we're talking about Lindsay, Lindsay's been getting around. I know talking with all the department heads and, and starting to meet with them and uh, really trying to connect with our employees and everything. So Lindsay, uh, a great job first, but uh, we're working on almost a month, is it? Yep, just shy of a month. Time flies, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it does, it has. Well, she got a break from me for her first two weeks. So. I know, I know, that was probably nice. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, this next one here is uh, waste and recycling expenses. So there's two things going on with this. Uh, one of which is the roll-off truck and one of which is a roll-off container. So the roll-off truck is our new lease payment on our new truck, um, actually adding that into uh, the general fund. That's a general fund expense as a capital expense. And then uh, secondarily, the roll-off container. I know, Jim, you and I talked, one is pretty well rusted out it sounds like right yeah the bottom's out of it now it's it's shot so in this um i had a question because when i read it last night we're not clear on what the lease payment is for i think we're pretty clear about hey this is for the container but it says the annual lease payment for the agreement but i think if we can add that it's for the truck um that would be more clear sure. <laughs> When I read it, it was like, all right, what are we leasing again? And then when you said it, you definitely explained it the right way. But right. I think it needs those words added into the uh, yeah, yep. resolution. We can do that. It's the uh, roll-off truck that moves the containers back and forth. Yeah. So. Nice. Anything else on this one, Jim? No, Doug, there's not. All right. Um, the other thing, Jim, Jim, let's just touch on just so, I mean, that we're watching the price of steel and everything is just escalating like crazy. Uh, when we originally talked about this, this was going to be 7,500 for that roll-off yep. container, and now it's 9,500. So we had to adjust this amount here as well as the it reduces the contingency. Contingency, by the way, is going to get dangerously low for April. We're going to have to do some sort of adjustment at some point in time in the future. But um, I don't know if there's anything else because you and I were also talking about stone and blacktop, even though the plants I don't even think have opened yet, right? But fuels going up. Just open, but everything is. Uh, escalated up, uh, steel's up 186% right now, uh, concrete's up, asphalt's up, fuel's up, so, and delays are long for getting product. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of demand if this infrastructure stuff starts to hit, so I could imagine <coughs> it hurt well, pricing. We did, you know, off the subject a little bit with the state's new budget, we are going to receive an additional 103,000 in revenue for CHIPS, Extreme Weather Recovery and Paved New York, which will help, but it's probably just gonna help offset our cost of asphalt. Yeah. 
That's the sad part. Instead of getting more done, we're just going to pay more. <laughs> I believe you're right, Linda. When the supply chain was so disrupted last year during COVID, you know, you, you remember back, uh, what was at the end of the year, we ordered our vehicles that we would normally order. And uh, Jim and I were just talking about it. Yeah. We don't even know when they're going to come in, but there's a back order on chips for the cars so or for the vehicles. Yeah, I was expecting our new truck in June, and they have no idea when we're going to see it due to the chip shortage. Oh, boy. Yeah, so... so. We, you know, a lot to, a lot in terms of the economy and, and the whole supply chain to catch up after the whole COVID situation. Um, because you say we don't know when we're going to see the new truck. I noticed we're surplusing the old ones still on schedule. Should we be holding off on putting them to surplus until we know when we're getting it? We can surplus and still keep them in service. And then when the truck comes, then I could just surplus it. Okay. Is it? Yeah, I'm not going to get rid of it until we have a new truck. Yeah. I would expect the truck to be here in June, so I'll do it in April and get it out there for the May auction, but I'll just wait. I would, yeah, if, you, if we don't know when the other one, we could get caught short. Maybe the delay is very long. We don't, yep. you know. So we'll review it again in June and see where we're at. Yeah, okay. Well, and that's just like, I know we ordered uh, some vehicles for parks and everything. And, and when you go through the bills this month, you see one of the parks vehicles even had to be towed back here. I mean, so we're, we're kind of limping <laughs> along. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so anyway. Okay. Uh, we talked about this um, a little bit previously. This right. is the creation of two new positions. These are promotional positions for two of our existing employees filling those positions in that being Michelle and Caitlin with everything that they've uh, been working on. So um, these two new senior clerk positions. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions on this. Happy to answer. None here. No. No. All right. Uh, moving on, the next one, acceptance of the annual drinking water report. Jim, I don't know if there's anything you want to touch on. With that. It's our annual report that we will be informing our residents in the Candagua Consolidated and Candagua Bristol water districts. Um, it, honestly, it's a cut and paste every year of what the city provides for information on what's in our water and then how much water is consumed and lost from each district. Thank you. And Jim, that, that is correct. I wanted to the date 2020. So it's for the previous year, right? That That's is correct. correct. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Uh, the next one here is uh, this is one of the ones we have a public hearing on the consolidation agreement of Kramer Road Water District into Canada were consolidated. So that you would hold the public hearing, obviously, early in the meeting. This is the actual language to consolidate Kramer Road into. Canada, well, the parent district consolidated. Uh, Jim, is there anything on that you want to touch on? I know you've been working on that. The project is completed. Just wait for DOH to approve it verbally for us to turn it out. Uh, the next one here is, uh, <clears throat> you know, that we previously had looked at this. This is the uh, project. This is the, the way I would usually describe it. this property is the southernmost property in the town of Canandaigua on the east side of the lake. Remember, we looked at this. This is the one off of 364, that parcel that adjoins the town of Hopewell and the town of Gorham. Um, and they had made application to um, be considered for mixed-use overlay. We referred it to the planning board. The planning board reviewed the application and found, and there's a report from the planning board saying that um, they believe this is within keeping of the mixed use overlay and the surrounding, they're recommending that it move forward. So this would be the town board authorizing the applicant to make application to the planning board for preliminary site plan approval, uh, at which point in time after they receive that approval, it would come back to the town board for final rezoning to mixed use. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions on that if I can. So the idea here is if the town board did not want to do this, this would be a time to stop it. And if we are okay with it, it's a time to just say, great, keep moving. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Any other questions on that one? No. Nope. Okay. 
uh, surplus transfer station equipment. I think that's the container that's rusted out, right? The, Correct. Is it even usable? No. We can't. We no. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next is the. I think those are the trucks you just talked about. Correct. Um, this lead next agency. one, oh, go ahead. Did you have a question on that? Oh, no, this is just lead, lead agency on Outhouse. Right. This is just going through the official seeker process with Outhouse West, the improvements for that. Uh, we had coordinated because of the size of it. Uh, we did a full coordinated review. MRD did that on our behalf and put this together for us. And so uh, this just uh, finishes up the seeker process for Outhouse West. Uh, the next one, we had received a request from the town of Farmington. Jim, I think you were working with the highway superintendent there, right, yep. for Town Line Road? Yep, and I had Gene put this together for us for the agenda for the PE9. So this would lower the speed limit uh, on the western portion of Town Line Road if the DOT approves it to 40 miles per hour? Correct. Yeah. We have two speed zones, two speed zones. One's 40, then it goes to 55. And the 55 goes to 40. So we're trying to make it all the same at 40. Uh, on the Canandaigua side of the road, that area that's currently 55, that's all primarily agriculture open area. But the north side of the road, the Farmington side, that's where they'll be building their future phases of their housing developments um, right. that they're working through. Auburn Meadows, I believe, is the name of that. So. Uh, this next resolution, this is um, the adoption of the, what I would call, I guess, the rewrite to the parks and rec section of code. Uh, quite a few red line changes in there. Um, a lot of it just references operations of parks. Um, I think the biggest thing that's new in that is the facility alcohol beverage permit that would be authorized um, associated with an event by an entity uh, that's, that's um, you know, we want to be very clear about that. That's the conversation that um, I had uh, myself with our insurance agent, um, as well as the Parks and Rec Committee. And I know we talked about that with the Ordinance Committee, Gary. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to chime in on that on or not. No, no not really, because the parks and the, you know, uh, Rec are the ones that uh, come forward with this proposal, most of it. And we did make some changes in the the ordinance, but uh, they're very minimal. So is the facility alcohol permit, say I'm a person and I'm having a party at the park, I cannot obtain it because I'm not an organization. Is that the rule? That is correct. And what's the definition of entity? Is, is it in there? It, um, let me pull that up. I don't, that's a great question, Kathy. And off the top of my head, I don't know, but it's, um, I'm sorry, I missed the question, Kathy. What is the definition of entity? You have to be an entity to get, but I could, you know. I'm an entity. Yeah, I could get, you know, my um, caterer to say they're an entity. And so if it's defined, that would be great. Such a way that they couldn't do that. Um, Go down here. So. Any, uh, any organization, their associated persons and uh, blah, blah, blah. They, 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 they do good. have to provide the insurance, everything that's all. I don't know. I don't think it's defined. I hear they're calling it a, an organization. Uh, there we're calling it an entity. Should we be consistent maybe? Well, I use the word entity. I don't know that that's oh, okay. Uh, did you All right, so organization. Yeah, that's so my concern. Is it's not clearly defined. You have something in mind what it should be, but it's not clear from what I saw. Well, yeah. I feel like I don't want it to be confusing for people. Like why one person can have it and one person can't. So the the big thing that the insurance company said, and that's why this section is in here, and and um, is is that. Somebody who is having a wedding, what the insurance agent told me is someone who is having a wedding who wants to um, provide alcohol to the guests that the town should not allow that. An entity, for instance, or I'm sorry, I said entity again, an organization like, for instance, the Canandaigua Chamber of Commerce, they want to hold a wine tasting event. 
No problem, because their insurance covers the town. So that was the that's the intent here. Right. So there's got to be a definition of that somewhere. So if my caterer has insurance, am I able to have a party there? Well, you would have to be an organization that has the liability insurance that the town requires, which is currently, I believe, what, $2 million? Mm -hmm. So if your caterer has $2 million worth of insurance, I guess, perhaps. So that goes to Kathy's point, though. Right. How to define what they need to have and what they are so that we know who can do this. Does that have to be in the local law or could that be like a policy that's adopted? Can't be policy. You have to, there may be a definition of organization somewhere else in, you know, like 501c3 organ. There's, I'm sure there's a definition somewhere in some law that you can just cross reference. But from working at the um, Civic Center, when we did events, pe people would come in and any, they could get, you know, a liquor license pretty easily. Um, a catering event or something. So I think you got to be careful. If that's not what you want, then you have to define organization clearly. And do we need to put the $2 million of liability insurance in the law or? I, I think I know so. in a, I think in other places, what we've said is the insurance is required at the time by the town board because the town board could change that. So something. where do we have it? Listed that, as that is spelled out. Uh, I know in some other documents, we'd have to pull that up, Linda. I don't okay. know off the top of my head, but I know it is spelled out somewhere that they require that. It's either a million or two million, but I almost think it's two million. I thought I saw it. I thought you just went past that, but my head's been spinning since reading this. Um, I know that there's a section in here that talks about proof of liability insurance. Um, it's F. Yeah. Yeah. You put in control F, you can search for the word million. I'm sorry, say it again. You hit control F and then you put search term million. You might be able yeah. to. I don't think it's in the. Um, it's not in this parks, law, no. It's not in the parks and rec. It's in another section. I know it's not in the parks and rec. It should be cross referenced then. I could, you know, yeah. as defined in whatever. Okay. Yeah. Let me make a note on that. So what would we do about these things that we're talking about right now relative to this law? Would we? So you can amend the law as long as it's not substantially different without having to re-advertise the public hearing. Um, so like the, the relative to the million and the definition of organization, They're it's really right. up to the town board to determine if whether or not that the town board believes that that is a substantial change or not. But we could amend that during the town board meeting and you could adopt that. We can get together a, um, a a little uh, proposal version right. basically for the meeting if, if the, perfect if take care of some of that stuff that sounds um, good because it feels like we can pretty quickly get that <clears throat> right, right. or if you're more comfortable in continuing it and continuing the public hearing or re-advertising with the updated you can do that too it's it's really up to the town board whatever you would like to do wouldn't it be better now to have it done uh you know when the season is going to be basically starting and so to amend it now i mean at the, the meeting yeah, so if we can get yeah. it amended for this one, I agree, Gary. That's a good point. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Good questions. Good discussion. Um, okay. The next one. This is uh, this is a uh, local law. This would amend the planned unit development language uh, for the center point PUD specifically, uh, Campus Drive. Um, to allow basically what the, the local law does is it allows the uh, development to construct closer to 332 than what's currently allowed by the planned unit development law to be more in keeping with the uptown study that we've completed as that, that kind of begins. Uh, ZBART is looking to construct there uh, on that property. As you enter campus drive, it would be the parcel that is closest to 332 on the left-hand side and they're looking to construct over closest to the corner that is Thomas Road. So um, this is what that means. 
Thank you. Right. Any questions on that one? No. Uh, the next one is uh, local law. Uh, Gary, I'm going to defer to you on this, these because you guys have been working through these. This is the lighting one, I know. Well, on this is what uh, we, the committee has, uh, you know, performed on uh, this is uh, because there's a lot of uh, changes in the lighting naturally over the last few years and where a lot of LED lighting has taken place now and instead of the others. And this is what, uh, you know, we're basically incorporating it into the uh, the local law plus some uh, other changes that were not uh, really uh, major didn't seem to be too controversial at least to this point and anybody has any questions on this one or uh, the next one is um this would be oh this is the request for the um the miller wilkin uh, project at the corner of um, County Road 32, Bristol Road, and State Route 21, where it all kind of comes together there. Uh, I know we talked about this in the Planning Public Works meeting. The Planning Public Works reviewed it and recommended that it move forward. Terry, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add on this one. No, uh, no, we we reviewed it, and it, it has a lot of uh, uh, benefits to the town specifically in terms of the uh, the uh, trails and uh, ability to cross from Miller Park over 21 into, you know, this development. And there's large sections of this that will be left in its natural state. The uh, developer will be putting in uh, trails and um, other amenities that will be open to the entire town, not just the residents of that area. The HOA will be charged with the maintenance of that so the town will not have any, <clears throat> excuse me, responsibility for maintaining any of those uh, amenities, those trails and, and such. So uh, large sections of this uh, development are going to be left uh, pretty much in their natural state. I think altogether it's in the 90 some uh, acre uh, size and uh, over 70 acres will be left, you know, virtually untouched. So uh, it looked like a very good use of the, the property. Uh, the uh, existing uh, design, the, the previous design, had a lot of these uh, townhomes kind of bunched together and uh, pushed into an area directly behind houses on, um, on uh, County Road 32. This will kind of straighten out that whole thing and, and bring them over the hill into uh, and down onto a Perry Street extension. The committee felt that it was a, you know, an excellent use of uh, the two properties combined and uh, would really benefit uh, the town in the long run. So they recommended approval of the uh, application for the increase in density. So Terry, I agree. Uh, this sounds like a great idea. Is there, and I'm sorry if I missed it, um, what makes sure that the that the people of the town could use the trails. Is there a, any risk that in the future, the people who own the HOA say, hey, we're only letting HOA members on the trails or is there a way that we're legally protected there? Yeah, there's a, uh, yeah, where's the section? The conservation easement, is that what yeah. that? Okay. Yes. Yeah, that's the, yeah the section that's highlighted here now. Okay, yeah. thank you. So it would be guaranteed in perpetuity, so, you know, HOA couldn't just walk away from it. Okay, perfect, thanks. Um, I, I thought I saw it, but somewhere in there, I thought maybe you should add it there as well, that I think the agreement was that the HOA would maintain trails or is the town maintaining the trails? I believe that the recommendation from the Planet of Public Works with the HOA would recommend. The one thing that, um, you know, I wanted to just have a brief conversation with you on this is you know, we do not have any restroom facilities at Miller Park, which this is obviously adjacent to Miller Park. And I know the developer is uh, joining us this morning, but um, one of the things that I would hope is if the, uh, if the town board is okay with this moving forward and granting two things, and if the planning board uh, approves it, that maybe we could look at a possible future restroom facility on that side of the road because they'll have sewer there where we do not have sewer in Miller Park to provide access to the to the public. Mm -hmm. um, Good point. 
and so we would need to figure out that. I would assume that we would probably be responsible for that uh, if we were to do something like that, but we would have to put that in the agreement and, and kind of draw that up. Uh, but we can work with the planning board on that. The other thing is, I just want to point out in this resolution that, um, so in the town code, it says clearly that the town board has the authority to grant up to the 15% density increase. However, the town code does not specifically spell out how the town board does that. And I know that we've had some conversations about that over the last couple of months uh, and what the process would be for that. I uh, talked with the town attorney about that. I even uh, talked with some folks at the Planning Federation. And so um, what this resolution would do is it would be the town board authorizing the planning board as part of the uh, review process to grant up to the 15%. So the town board has ultimately the authority whether or not this happens, but the town board is saying basically, yes, you can have up to the 15% provided you get the approval from the planning board. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, any other questions? Sounds good. Well, that sounds good. And hopefully the, uh, I noticed Jeff Morrell is sitting in on this discussion and hopefully you heard the, uh, the uh, statement you made regarding uh, restroom facilities there. The only thing I would ask Doug is if that's a, a possibility that when, when they install the sewer to put in a sewer lateral, extend it out past the right away for future connection, just to, so it's done while the ground's already done. So maybe we gotta dig it up and try and drill underneath the road and do this work for the future. If it can be done, it's just something to think about when we do this. Okay. Oh, Jeff uh, provided a comment here through the chat. I think everybody should be able to unmute themselves in this meeting, but um, happy to provide comment and sewer access and location for future bathroom, I think is what he said. Here. Great. Okay, um, anything else on that one? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, Gary, I'll kick this back over to you. This is an ordinance committee one relative to manufactured housing, uh, local law. Yes, this is uh, something the, uh, you know, the committee's uh, had before them. Uh, I looked last night when I was going through the material since uh, January of 20. And of course, the pandemic hitting, uh, you know, it slowed uh, things up on it. And so we haven't been putting things forward for uh, public hearings and some of this stuff now we're moving forward. Uh, it's just a slight changes and things like that. I think I mentioned before when we were talking a week or, or the last meeting or whatever, the finance meeting, is that uh, uh, the development department has worked with uh, HUD and uh, the, the uh, state in regards to, uh, you know, the uh, criteria for manufactured homes. And uh, I know there was one uh, board member that had, uh, you know, a question on it and rightfully so on something. And and we have, uh, you know, changed that wording and it seems to be acceptable to them and, and everyone else. And so uh, I was going to make an amendment uh, to the, uh, uh, per, uh, the uh, resolution at the uh, board meeting on the 19th, if we move it forward. Uh, there's another uh, item that come up uh, yesterday, uh, late yesterday afternoon in regards to it. And uh, I'm undecided at the present time until I, you know, check with uh, some of the other committee members and make them aware of what the question was. If uh, we will proceed uh, at this meeting for the public hearing or if we will draw it and hold off for, uh, you know, a future public hearing on it. It's a question. Pardon? What's the question? Uh, the question was uh, brought up in regards to the RLD. At the present time, uh, you know, manufactured homes are not allowed in, are allowed in the town, but not in the RLD. And then, uh, you know, uh, this one here eliminates that and there is allowed to uh, place through uh, out any uh, zoning district within the town. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want to discriminate against the RLD. So Gary, you said um, you said something about the public hearing. So we advertised the public hearing on this. So I think in terms of like process, I believe we need to open the public hearing, but you as a town board could certainly continue the public hearing or close the public hearing, whatever you want to do. But I believe we need to at least open it because we advertised right. it. Right. Okay. 
So what this would say is we could have a trailer, uh, a double white trailer on the lake, so long as it has a concrete footing. Right. Just a manufactured home, a double wide. Uh, yeah, there was something in the uh, information here on, in regard to double wides. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. they they are permitted. They are permitted in uh, you know outside of a manufactured. At least the ones are outside a manufactured home park. And I know that there's a reference to double wide here in this paragraph. Um, so that was that that was eliminated in the uh, the the uh, material that I received and uh, to strike that to double white out. Well, and then are we striking this whole public section? One? It said all double all manufactured home located out of manufactured home park shall be included with a permanent masonry skirting. So is this not right? That we're looking at, Gary. Uh, yeah, no, because we uh, it, number A was uh, let's see the use of it. Man, I can't see it now, Doug. What you brought up, or what you have up there, I have it before me. So I have a red line version here that still references the double wide. Let me pull up the draft local law so we can look at that real quick. So this still talks about double wide manufactured housing. No, because that was number four. Uh, on it, so that would been uh, struck out, I believe. I get for a second, I grab it here. And this is what's included in our handout, Doug. Mm -hmm. What you're looking yeah, so at. So I'm going to go back to the March meeting. That's what I'm looking at to see what we advertised as the public hearing. So give me just a quick second. So uh, ordinance manufactured homes. So the draft local law. So Gary, I don't know what happened, but the version that we advertise sounds like it's not what you're looking at. So is that, uh, no. So no. that we, we probably do need to uh, open, close it, and re, re right. advertise it. Yeah. yeah. OK. Next month. So Gary, the yeah. only thing is, I don't know what you're looking at. It's not here in the. It's not in our working folder, so it sounds like we need to touch base. I know we're going to touch base, I think, tomorrow on some stuff. Let's touch base on that. So Okay, yeah. All right, so that one's off the table for this month. Okay. All right, next resolution is uh, the Lincoln Hill Farm Catering Alcoholic Beverage License Notification. This is just the standard resolution. Uh, town doesn't express mm -hmm. an opinion one way or the other. Um, that is uh, that's right across from the Lakeview Manufactured Home Park, um, right across the street from that other MU1 application that is being sent over to the planning board. So it's that commercial building right there. Ah, okay. On 364, it's the the yes. Yeah. Okay. At one point in time, it was pink and blue and purple or something or other, but <laughs> they they've done a lot of work to clean that up. Um, this next resolution is authorization for the town assessor to begin the, the reval process. Um, and I don't think Pam is with us, but uh, this really kicks off the process. This would go into uh, 2022. Uh, it would be the rest of this year. And then with the final role being certified, I believe it's March of 2022 uh, with, the, with the new assessments. And our plan is Pam will be doing this with the assistance of Michelle. Is that the plan? Michelle and also the county, just as Chris did uh, two, three years ago in 2018. So yes, so Michelle would be working and supporting Pam through this effort. And then um, they would also be utilizing the services of, of the county, Sylvia Staples and Tom Farley from the county. Um, and then paying a rate. I did, this is not a budgeted expense uh, for 2021. Um, so I was talking to Pam about that, and uh, she said that what the county had said is that they would bill once the work is complete. So it would actually be a 2022 bill. So we would need to put this in the 2022 <laughs> budget. Any adjustments to uh, assessments wouldn't really affect tax bills until 2023, though, Doug? So that uh, when we do the 20, when we adopt the budget for 22 in November of 
essentially October, November of 21, that would be based on the March 21 uh, taxable value. So the taxable value in March of 2022, right, it would be the, and I'm talking this out loud with you to answer your question. So it would be the November, October, November of 23 budget that would be based on that new taxable value. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, the next resolution. Uh, this is uh, the folks that we've been working with, uh, Think Big, Inclusive in Motion. This is the Outhouse West. They would like to do a fundraiser, a golf ball drop. Um, and uh, with the support of, uh, I think, uh, one or both of our local fire departments being the city and Cheshire. And uh, they'd be, it's a fundraiser that they would be doing and dropping golf balls over at Outhouse Park associated with that. So this would be uh, acknowledgement and authorization for them to uh, to do that. So they are moving right along. Um, they continue to raise money. They've continued to have some pretty large contributions and they're super excited about uh, getting started. Uh, they're hoping very soon on breaking ground. Great. That's great. So I, uh, I did suggest to them just for fun. I think it would be hilarious if they dropped the golf balls over the parking lot and watch them bounce all over, but they didn't like that. <laughs> idea, so. Hilarious. <laughs> Uh, let's see, this next resolution authorizes uh, tree planting at Outhouse Park. Our tree team would like to do a, a tree planting associated with um, uh, Arbor Day, basically. And a spot has been identified in Outhouse Park for that tree to go. So this authorizes that. I'm not sure if anybody has any questions on that. Uh, the next resolution, uh, again, we were putting Lindsay to work right off the bat here. Uh, United Way kicking off this thing as we're trying to get back to normal post-COVID. Hopefully everybody's got their second shot. By the way, almost all of our employees have their second shot now. So wow. we're working through that. There's a few that are still kind of working, but almost all of our employees have their second shot. But um, Lindsay, do you just want to touch base on this? Yeah. So um, we would like to designate the month of May as Community Involvement Month. So just like in years past with our partnership with the United Way annual campaign, um, this is just to make, you know, it somewhat official that May is our United Way um, community Involvement Month. Um, so some of the events are just like previous years, the annual day of caring for our volunteer event, which this year is going to be a Thursday on May 20th. So we're going to get some of our employees to, um, to volunteer, most likely at the 4-H camp in Bristol, and then as well as the Ontario County Food Drive just to participate in that. Um, and then um, as well as um, doing any donations to United Way to help our local communities, just being able to distribute that to the employees for involvement. Okay. That's great. Um, these ne any other questions on that one? I'm sorry. Nope. Okay. Nope. The next three resolutions are Linda's favorite sureties. Well, it made me think that the uh, the meeting was done. I'm like, oh, we're at the end, and then all of a sudden, I went, wait a minute, there's one more uh, resolution. And then uh, Jared had emailed me specifically and asked to include this resolution. I am going to provide him the dates that he provided, but I didn't want to amend his resolution because he specifically requested it to go on the agenda. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is from him. I'm sure that there'll be some sort of discussion at the town board meeting relative to that. But is, this seems to be telling or kind of saying the town board's going to take a break from doing what we're supposed to be doing. Linda, I, I can't uh, really comment. I know. I was hoping Jared would be here so we can have a discussion about it. Because we have that. Where are we with the process of, um, you know, our our planning, our CIC and all the stuff we've been working on? Um, various stages, depending on various topics. Obviously, we have the comp plan that's getting close. Um, the yeah. plan is, I believe, for the May town board meeting, the uh, CIC is be uh, recommending the comprehensive plan, I believe, at the May town board meeting to be setting a public hearing in June and hopefully adoption of the new comp plan by uh, June or July anyway. Um, additionally, we have uh, conservation subdivision, conservation um, easement or conservation subdivision regulations. I know we have a meeting coming up with our team next week relative to uh, the recommendations we've been working uh, through a series and it's been delayed for a variety of reasons, including a personal reason from uh, the main principal at Labella that we've been working with, but uh, that got a little bit delayed, but I know that they we've got recommendations now and there's a team meeting next week on that. So um, there's a variety of different things that are, I think, uh, getting ready to 
be ready for the town board to consider. They're getting close, um, you know, but um, that's kind of leave it at that. Okay, all right. I'll be interested to hear about what what is, you know, kind of provoking this resolution. But, okay. Just as a just as a side note here, I when I was on the uh, town planning board fifteen years ago. There was quite a bit of discussion at that time about developing ridgeline guidelines. We have guidelines, but we don't have any local law. We don't really have any teeth in it. It would be great to have ridgeline guidelines strengthened. But that said, it's been 15 years and nobody's been able to really give definition to this. It's an extremely difficult uh, undertaking. It's not just uh, land use. I mean, there's a lot of emotion and a lot of other factors that enter into this thing. So uh, six months to create something like this when it's been 15 year effort. Well, and to stop doing what we normally have to do is kind of right. business seems like a, a not something that I would support. No, I, I, uh, I agree, Linda. I, I don't think that this is the right uh, direction to go in. I I would uh, wonder how this would impact uh, uh, the future of the town. I think it sends a message that we're anti-development and we aren't. Yeah. We're all for protecting the lake and protecting agriculture and those efforts, you know, and we have very strong efforts in those areas. This isn't the right direction. Yeah, so, all right. There was, um, Terry, you mentioned the, the view shed or the ridge line. I know that, um, I don't remember the exact date. I'll try to look it up. There was, we had a project team that was working on this uh, and I believe yes. it was the Environmental Conservation Board also at the time. And they had recommended ridge line uh, law uh, code and uh, taking the guidelines from a guideline to actually code and actually including with that view shed, but it became very complicated. And I believe the town board, if I remember correctly, was not comfortable in moving forward in that direction. Yeah, well, it, it was, was five there. years ago. I remember because I was really yeah. new. And my concern with that was um, what that team had provided was <clears> designed <throat> to, I, I remember <clears throat> Mulvaney very clearly saying, well, a 2000 square foot home can have this much. And to me, it needed to be based on a percentage of your ridge line, not based on the size of your house or the size of your property. You know, it was, I said, because it seemed like people could um, chop their property up into smaller bits and obtain more ability to destroy ridge line. But I don't remember where it went after that, but I remember that discussion pretty clearly, but it was about five years ago. It went just exactly where it's always gone, and that's to the back burner. It's just because of what you mentioned and a lot of other factors. And as Doug said, it's an extremely complicated thing because, I mean, when you go from ridge lines, well, people's views of a ridge, people's view of a ridge line, what is a ridge line? What constitutes it? Right. Is it strictly from the other side of the lake looking across the lake? It, the very I'll top that right or then you get into view sheds and things like this that 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 are within perhaps not visible from the lake not visible from the other side of the lake and with respect to this one you know however well intended it is the scr1 isn't all ridge line i mean there are many other areas that are not on a ridge that are within the scr1 so uh, to, to tell people that they cannot do something in the entire SCR1 for six months. And I, and I would say that six months is uh, really a, a wishful. Yeah, that's right. Thing, you know? um, I, I just, it's just not the right uh, direction, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with you. Um. I believe if nobody else has anything else, I, I think that's the end uh -huh. of the... The other businesses, Doug, there's two other businesses. Oh, the, yeah. I just, before we move on, I came in after the, the, the first resolution. Was that discussed? Which is the acceptance? Oh, no, we didn't. On the special oh. election, we did not really. Oh. We just no, that the town board could decide whatever on Monday. We didn't really talk about that. Okay. 
did Kathy, would you like to provide a comment? I know you had emailed too, so. No, I mean, you know, my research showed that you can't do an advisory, um, I'm sorry, I can't think of, um, referendum. So I, I didn't know if you had heard from Chris on that, Nadler. Um, yes, so I did have, uh, Kathy, I don't think anybody is disagreeing with what you, uh, what you, um, your email. Um, I had had a conversation with Chris Nadler. I know he had a series of conversations and he certainly can provide comment relative to his thoughts. But um, in terms of a general uh, question like this, uh, like what is proposed here on the screen, it's probably not something that the town board should do that may be against uh, the regulations as you pointed out. What he also had shared with me is that from his research and his discussion, there's also, while you're not supposed to do it, there's probably no real enforcement mechanism unless somebody wanted to file a lawsuit against the town for doing it. So that's where the town board ultimately, I think, has the decision to make, but it's, is it a great idea? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, the research says you can't use town monies to do it. So I suppose if someone wanted to donate money, <laughs> you'll <laughs> Uh, by the way, the Tishner Point property, I'll just share with you, I was going to update you on this on um, on Monday too, but um, I did dump, reach out to the realtor just to kind of check on the process and uh, everything is moving forward with that. Uh, and they're expecting a closure on that before the end of the month. I know uh, the Parks and Rec chairman had reached out to me yesterday and said that he had heard it to come back on the market, but uh, the realtor is telling me now that everything is still moving forward with the closure on that. So. Okay. All right, so the pilot. Uh, pilot. So, um, you know, I, you know, I want to be careful here because there is a request. You see, there's a request in writing from uh, this entity that would like to request the town uh, provide a pilot for the solar exemptions or for the solar projects. So they would like to uh, be heard relative to that request. Um, you know, we've, we've seen these types of requests in the past and we have not honored these requests. We do have multiple solar projects very similar in the town of Canandaigua. So that's something that, um, you know, I think that you know, out of respect, I probably should let them do their uh, okay. quick little request and then the town board should consider what they want to do. So. All right. And then the cannabis? Uh, the cannabis legislation. So, um, and I'll touch on this on, on Monday too. There's also a, um, some, uh, quite a bit of information attached. So if the town would like to opt out, we need to pass a local law uh, before the end of the year. Uh, we need to have a public hearing on that local law before we would pass that local law, and that local law would be subject to permissive referendum if we decide to opt out. If we decide to opt out, we would not be able to participate in the revenue sharing associated with uh, the anticipated revenue sharing associated with it. So uh, there's a lot of information. Actually, I just participated in a webinar uh, yesterday on this, and uh, I'm following up with a couple of questions, and then I'll hopefully be able to give you a little bit more in-depth presentation. But it really comes down to whether or not the town wants to opt out by law of allowing retail dispensaries in the town of Canada. Okay, and you can you. opt out, but you have to, if you're going to opt out, you have to opt out by the end of the year. You can opt back in at any time, but you can't opt out after that. It's not just dispensaries. It's also the, um, the lounge, lounges where you can ingest. So the bars, if you will, where you can, um, ingest cannabis products. You could do both. You could do one or the other. If you opt out by December 31st, you can opt back in at any time, as I said, but if you don't opt out now, you can never opt out. Yeah. So um, the, the presentation that I was part of, there's a lot of information that's still, that's not very clear in the law. And so there's still, um, there's still comments, I guess, that are being provided or opinions that are being provided about the law, for instance, like whether or not, uh, whether it's a dispensary or a lounge, whether or not they would be able to offer any other product. And uh, what I was told is that probably not. Um, they might be able to sell alcohol, but for instance, they might not be able to sell wine or they may not even be able to sell alcohol. Uh, my um, understanding was that it could only be cannabis, no alcohol. You can't have a, but I, I haven't, 
parse the whole statute, but I will. Right. Well, and a lot of the statute actually is missing that type of stuff. That's yeah. what I believe they're running into is the, the problem is, you know, some of it is ambiguous. And so there's there's questions surrounding some of that. And it's probably going to have uh, comments and opinions that are provided, you know, for a while on this. But as Kathy said, you do, if you want to opt out of this, you have to do it by the end of the year. If you don't want to opt out, then you've got to essentially, however you want to incorporate it in zoning, which would require zoning changes if you don't opt out. So a uh, variety of different things to think about. It's, you know, you do have a little bit of time, but it's something to start thinking about um, yeah. in terms of what the, what the town board wants to do in terms of that. Um, it's also my understanding we are not allowed to opt out of the, and Kathy, I don't know if you can speak to this, but we're not allowed to opt out of the personal use, basically. So any resident of the town of Canada or of the of state of New York has the ability to use up to a certain amount. There's nothing that the town of Canada can do about that. So you can limit where it's used in terms of like smoking. Like if you don't allow smoking in certain situations, you can prohibit the smoking. As I understand, again, I have to read the whole uh, marijuana. The ingestion by gummies, or of course you can't like not, you know, tackle someone because they're eating cannabis gummies, but um, but you can limit in that. So if we have park areas where you don't allow smoking, then you could, but yes. The, and, you know, in terms of agricultural, the growing, all that other stuff, the only things you can opt out of are those two specific things. Okay. What is the, uh, does anyone know, what's the origin of the use of the, the term dispensary? I mean, dispensary to me is like a pharmacy where, you know, you, I mean, dispensary, it, I mean, these are just going to be retail outlets, aren't they? I think it was because originally it was allowed for medical. Yeah. And, you're right, I, from a, and then they just had, they stuck with the term. So, yeah, I think it's just being stuck with that term. The medical well, dispensaries um, down here are like standalone bank buildings. You know, they're, they're like a little drugstore, but it's for cannabis in Florida. Is it legal in Florida, Kent, or uh, Linda? Yeah, it's more legal than there. I don't know the different uh, things, yeah. but I know that if if we wanted to get like CBD oil down here that we could not get in New York State, we could get it here. And mm. there's a there is a stand, like I said, a standalone big building that's right next to our car wash. That's, uh, oh. but it's but it's I, it might still be a little bit of prescription um, use for that bank building. I don't know. I don't go there myself, so I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Um, but again, we have time on that, but as Kathy said, it has to be done yeah. by year if you're going to opt out. So um, the last one there, we've got an ordinance committee coming up, I believe it's April 21st. Uh, Lamar's going to do a presentation relative to the outdoor display signs, just as a refresher. Uh, this is not to discuss the uh, the litigation. This is just to discuss uh, or to do a presentation kind of on what these things would look like, just because it's been so long for all of us, just trying to get back up to speed on where we are with, with all of that. Um, I did have one other thing that I did not include, but I wanted to ask the board, and, and we have the majority of the board here, and we can touch on it again just to confirm on Monday night, but um, uh, in terms of in public meetings, um, you know, I know that we've got the Board of Assessment Review um, is going to be meeting in May, and uh, specifically the assessor tells me they're requesting to be able to meet in person. Um, I know some of the committees are starting to ask me, is it, is it okay if we start meeting in person? Um, one of the things, my thought, and I, I've talked to several um, different managers, we, you know, we have a managers group in New York, the 64 managers, and I've talked to everybody kind of what's, what's going on, and, and I looked at some different things. If we're going to do a hybrid meeting, which I suspect we probably are, one of the things that uh, generally the, the best suggestion is that the the, especially for your elected officials that are in the room together, if they're going to be in a room together or your official that's making a decision, that there essentially be a camera in front of each one of them so that the person that is participating by Zoom uh, gets the same experience as if it was a complete in by Zoom meeting. So um, there is a way for us to do that. I was actually talking with Gene and Tyler. Uh, we've got the conference room that is the Oriana conference room, which is the smaller conference room downstairs that's right below my office. And uh, I set that up uh, just to kind of see how it would go. But I have the ability to kind of 
uh, almost provide six feet of separation between the various individual smaller tables. And I can set up uh, with some uh, des desktop computers that we have, I, I have the ability to set up so that basically I could put up five stations with five individual cameras and microphones, essentially, uh, all using stuff that we have here in the town hall uh, to be able to set that up so that hopefully it would be a seamless type of a meeting for the person, whether or not the official is in the room or by if the, the person is participating by Zoom. Um, the attraction for using that room is because obviously court uses the big room. And if we have to constantly be tearing down and setting up for our various meetings, if we're gonna start allowing them in person, um, that becomes a bit more challenge with moving that many computers and everything else, as opposed to just leaving it set up in the Oriana room so that whether it's the town board, the planning board, the zoning board, the, um, you know, uh, whatever committee wants to use it, that they would be able to use that and still allowing the public to participate remotely by Zoom. So um, just kind of wanted to touch, check in with you all on that and kind of see where everybody was at. I know uh, specifically the city of Canandaigua, just so you're aware, they're completely still by Zoom and their intent is to remain by Zoom for the time being. But I just wanted to check in with you all to see kind of where you were at with it. So is if we were doing it in that little room, none of the public would be able to come in? because It would, so it would have to be very limited. It would have to be very, very limited. You could probably accommodate a few people in person. Uh, but it would be very limited if we're going to do it in that, that smaller room. We would probably need uh, to continue with the hybrid meeting and asking the public to participate as much as possible uh, by Zoom. So couldn't well, we just have like a laptop in front of us in the other room? Um, yes, I, I know that we don't have enough laptops right now for, uh, we were talking about that, uh, for all the town board members. But I, um, have, I could share, I have a design if anybody, I mean, if that would be easier, you know. It, it definitely would be easier, yes, if we had enough laptops. But I know that, uh, Jean, that's correct. Tyler told us we don't have enough laptops, right? Correct. That is correct. I and mean, I think most of us probably have our own portable device. And if not, I have extra. I mean, I have. But the challenge is then, I know, for instance, the Board of Assessment Review, they don't. Right. Um, well, that's that's you know, and that's, then you get into the planning board and the zoning board and the other boards. So it's like, I it's it would probably be good to be consistent among all of our boards and groups if we're gonna if we're gonna do this. But again, uh, just kind of you know whatever everybody would want to do. And and specifically to that question relative to the public, I know that the city manager told me that's the reason that the city is choosing to stay by right. Zoom right now because they didn't want to start meeting in person without the public being able to attend in person also. That, that's a hard part. And the other thing that I think Zoom has actually improved people's ability to hear us and see us in the, in the meeting. You know, it, when it was broadcast before or if you ever called in remotely, it was impossible to hear. Whereas on Zoom, we're really hearing people, they're hearing us better. And so I, I like to be in person, but I also don't want to lose that functionality of Zoom for people who can't be at the meeting because I feel like more people can participate in our government if they can hear us and see us. So I, I like the, Kathy's idea of having the open laptops in front of us. You know, if, if we had a mix of laptops that the town had and per, people bringing their own and logging in to the meeting, just so that everybody can hear better. And maybe at some point the town... I don't want to spend more money, but you know, right. like iPads or something for at least for ten, this is going to be the wave of the future. Um, at the county level, we each have iPads, um, right? Tablets that sat in the stand in front of us. Doesn't it's have to really be. be Chrome, Chromebooks are so cheap now; you get them for like a hundred, two hundred dollars. Two dollars, right? Oh. With cameras and microphones. Well, if Doug says that uh, they have the, we have the uh, physical equipment to uh, use that small room. I'm all in favor of using it. And not spending any more money. Yeah, I, uh, the people can't be with us if they. How want many to. people come to our meetings, Linda? Good point, one. Good point, one. Uh, well, sometimes we have a couple. We, we we don't have to chase them away. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. We don't we really. Could, have we could we better. could try it. I mean, we could just do a poll here to see who has their own device that could come and do it. Um, it doesn't make much sense to sit in a small room together, um, but I would. I'm 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 very tired of Zoom. Um, yep. I really want to get back to doing yeah. 
person. I'll bring my I laptop. Too, Kathy. I usually bring my laptop anyway, so I'm, I'll bring mine. Well, you have to ask the question, why do we all get vaccinated if we can't get back together? Are well, you suggesting doing in-person only meetings and not doing No. 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 Hybrid. Hybrid. Oh. Right. But with this, you know, our thing in front of us and right. as Linda said, I usually bring some sort of device anyway. Right. Um, and if, you, if there's not the capability for the other ones to do it, that's fine. But I think it's a step back towards getting back to normal. Um, I think it's going to be the wave of the future anyway. And I agree with Linda Probably, that, it's yeah. great that we have that capability. Let's give it a try. It doesn't work. We're no worse off. I don't want to go back to this, but we do what we have to do. Well, for a number of years, we've had uh, people from FLTV come in and give us a sales pitch, you know, to uh, broadcast our meetings. We've saved that money over the years. Now we don't have to because we have this capability. Right. It's kind of, I mean, a very individual capability. So yeah, this is even better. better you know? It's better than what they have because I've seen the city yeah. meetings and they are difficult to hear still. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a professional uh, recording, but the Zoom is right in front of us. You hear oh, it clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tired of seeing my face, but. <laughs> that's, that's the thing in in the different people that i've talked to and there's even there's even new companies that are popping up that specialize in zoom hybrid meetings and stuff and you can watch but the biggest thing is exactly what you're saying is when zoom and just like right now we all have a camera in front of us and so the person that's participating remotely should be able to have that same benefit of seeing us as if we were all in the same room together and that's the challenge when you plop a camera up in the front of the room to try to cover the whole room. Right. Yeah. That, that becomes very difficult to do. So that's why you've got to have really the microphone and the camera in front of the person. Now we can set it up for instance, like, and, and the other thing is the Oriana room downstairs. And I realize it's a smaller room, but it already has, for instance, like a TV monitor built into the wall and everything. So we could set it up so that you're seeing everybody together, either on your screen, on your laptop, on your desktop, whatever's in front of you, as well as on the screen and everybody's hearing from that but that the microphone is and the camera is picking up you as the individual person in front of you uh, or the person in front of the camera so that that person who's participating, whether they're from Florida or wherever, that they're getting the same experience as the, as the, other, as the other folks. So uh, when, it, and we can, again, we can touch on this. I know, Kathy, you said you might not be able to be at the meeting on Monday, but uh, we can touch again on this on Monday. But if we could pull this off, do you want to shoot for like May or June town board meeting, something or other like that? And and if we were going to shoot for that, then I would say, why don't we try it at the finance meeting so that if we have like feedback due to microphones or whatever, that we work it at an earlier meeting, work it all out rather than work it out during the actual town board meeting. Sounds good. Yep. So. Um, you mean the, the, the finance committee meeting next week? No, no, we don't have one next week because we have the town. Oh, there isn't one next week. And this oh. is the third Tuesday. So it would be next week. So the one week. before, before yeah, May's meeting, town yeah. board meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's okay. Thursday. <laughs> Sounds good. May the 12th, I believe, would be the next one. So. Yeah. So, All right. Okay. I got to hop off, guys. I will. All right. Thank you. Okay. And I think that's it. Does anyone else have anything else that we need to talk about? Nope. Nope. Okay, good meeting. Lot to, lot to cover and talk to everyone Monday. Hey, join my friend here. So, hey, Fiona. Oh. I say hi to Fiona. <laughs> Sleeping. Not the one tired, one tired pooch. <laughs> She's protecting me from the electricians working in the kitchen. Uh, I can see good protection. Wants to make sure I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later. Bye. Have a good day, okay. everybody. Bye. Nice seeing everybody. Bye bye.